Margaret is uh, associate professor and head of, sorry, area head of digital art in the Department of Studio Art and senior research scientist with the Pervasive Technology Institute at the Indy University in Bloomington. She received a PhD from University of Plymouth, UK, and an MA, MFA from University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, and Margaret has been creating virtual environments since her first cave piece in 1995. And her presentation... <laughs> I was going to stop there. No, no, no. Thank you very much, Andrew. I appreciate the introduction. I wanted to um, mention that uh, my MFA advisor was Dan Sandin, so he's in a hard act to follow. I haven't seen those videos that he showed, but um, I want to say that the, the Electronic Visualization Lab at the University of Illinois at Chicago really mentored a lot of women and a lot of women in new media arts and virtual reality. And because of them, I'm up here on this stage. And I see so many men in this audience that I just want to make a plea to you to help mentor the women in your organizations and in your lives to um, reach out into technical and technological areas. So it's my little thing. But I'm, I don't direct the Advanced Visualization Lab at Indiana University. I'm a senior research scientist with the Pervasive Technology Institute, and I work a lot with the Advanced Visualization Lab. Um, the senior manager is Eric Wernert, who's actually in charge of a few different research areas at Indiana University. Michael Boyles is the um, managing director of the Advanced Visualization Lab proper, and Ed Dambic is one of the programmers there. So what I'm going to be talking about is a little bit about what the lab is like and kind of our past model and our present model, which is more of a distributed facility. This is uh, the Innovation Center. We have a VCT there, one of my students, and their virtual reality project. So the lab actually started in 1997, and that was before I got to Indiana University. But they had a cave in Bloomington, Indiana, which is about an hour south of Indianapolis, where we have the IUPUI campus. It's a joint campus between Indiana University and Purdue. In Bloomington, we had a cave. And in Indianapolis, we had an immersive desk. There were four staff, two in each campus. And now, today, we have eight full-time staff with a plethora of research GAs and interns. So. At this point in time, we're more interested in enabling and empowering the IU community, including the faculty and the staff and the students. And still, our mission is very much about research, teaching, creative activity, and community engagement. And creative activity at IU means the arts. For me, um, the creative activity and research is one and the same. When I got there, we had this single visualization facility. So it was a lab that was behind locked doors. It had very limited access. Not a whole lot of people could use it. Not a whole lot of people uh, could take the time to develop um, the technology skills to be able to use it. So there were a few of us who actually worked in the lab. And the staff kind of um, decided which researchers would actually get into the lab. So there was limited areas of focus in terms of research. But now there's a new model for our technologies where we're kind of opening up the access to the visualization systems. And we're helping people to test their content and we're actually creating visualization workflows so that people can jump into these systems a little bit easier. 
And so the Advanced Visualization Lab has a lot of um, videos and different documents available for people to begin to use these facilities. So now we have a, a distributed visualization model and it's um, more democratic in terms of its use. And the reason for this is because the um, graphics hardware has become so much more accessible. And there's a much larger community using computer graphics now uh, than just what was once the computer science um, community. So now we have facilities all across campus and no longer housed in just the single facility. So we're trying to kind of uh, test things and build out the future ideas in the lab and then deploy those across campus and have a much more sustainable model. So these images that I'm showing you are um, my students' work. So this is actually one of my students standing in front of our um, kind of cave-like theater with inside his own VR project. Um, so then we see the Advanced Visualization Lab becomes more of a distributed visualization facility. And what it does is it le leverages enterprise services across campus in order to make more public accessible labs and student technology centers. So there's different places at IU that control different parts of the de technology deployment. So the Advanced Visualization Lab tests out those things and then these enterprise services actually deploy those um, devices. So they're really interested in content creation, digitization, and advanced media. And basically the overview of their mission is through having dedicated workshops where they will take assets and provide interfaces and help people display their different environments in order to create different types of experience. So people will come to the lab with specific types of data. These tend to be 2D media, text, audio, 3D data. And then in the existing support areas, we have virtual reality, augmented reality, IQ tables, information visualization, IQ walls and uh, printing and advanced media capture, which I'll kind of go through. And then we deploy them in reality labs, accessible public locations, libraries, and lobbies of various buildings across campus. They're trying to build black box innovation labs. So we're actually taking out our caves and building kind of black boxes, reconfigurable spaces. And um, looking at how things can be more portable as well. So the reality labs, there are um, large format displays like the virtual collaborative theater or the IQ wall, which are high quality, inherently collaborative devices. We also have head mounted displays and mobile displays, and then the pipe system, which adds environmental feedback to virtual reality. So these reality labs are being deployed across campus that include um, fives and high-end graphic stations and some large display systems as well. One of the devices that the Advanced Visualization Lab created was the um, pipe system. And there's a movie file there. And the pipe system is a you sit within this contraption here and you wear a head-mounted display oculus and it has these fans and heat lamps and a smell system. Is there sound for that or? Is there sound for the video? In the scent of traditional Roman foods. A constrained navigation path guides the user through the palace, stopping at specific points to present a view of the palace ruins from today's perspective. 360 degree spherical photographs taken at the site in 2012 are displayed with the correct alignment to the virtual palace reconstruction. 
The overall system relies on a head-mounted display type interface configured for a seated user experience. Standard desk fans and heat lamps are positioned around the user. The Programmable Immersive Peripheral Environmental System, or PIPES, acts as a control interface between the PC and the fans, heat lamps, and SENT system. The SENT system is composed of an air compression unit, solenoid valves, and liquid scents mounted perpendicular to the pneumatic lines. The PIPES controller directly operates each solenoid valve to provide olfactory feedback. Environmental feedback events are triggered dynamically from automated virtual sensors or manually from scripted events. So that's, um, that was Chauncey who actually um, developed the pipe system up in Indianapolis and he was given a um, best research demo award at IEEE VR last year. And the work that you saw was Bernie Frischers who is a professor in informatics. They're working also with uh, augmented reality. We have various collections on campus. The Department of Geological Sciences has um, a paleontology collection. And so they've been scanning various bones. And then um, when you uh, look at a photograph that's on a table, then that 3D scan will come up in augmented reality. Uh, we have a lot of IQ walls on campus, and um, they're all run by Windows PCs, so any student with an account to the university with any login can get into one of these IQ walls. They're freely available across campus. Uh, they're ultra-high resolution. They're great for collaboration and for teaching. And I had my students do a art show using the IQ wall, and they do video and photography and all, VR, all kinds of stuff. And they decided to do this. This is the piece that they came up with, with uh, just a few colors and millions and millions of pixels. And um, they're very interested in conceptual art. And so I find it really interesting when we provide them with all these pixels and these, you know, really fantastic displays, you know, they turn it on their, on, you know, turn it upside down and say, but this is what we want, to, you know, bask in pure color. So <laughs> I think it's uh, very valuable to have these uh, different approaches around. And so that's what the uh, arts can provide technologies and a new way of looking at things. So these IQ walls, as I mentioned, are across campus in various buildings. And they're being used for different things um, in the Global and International Studies Building, in the Mathers Museum of World Culture, in the Scholars Commons, the Department of Biology. So all across campus, these um, IQ walls have been set up. And some of them are touch screen and some are not. Some of them are stereo capable and some of them are not. Some of them are, are really huge and some are um, a little bit smaller. Um, so this is the IQ wall in the Wells Library and the right hand side is a movie. You may recognize this is Bill Sherman at the IQ wall and uh, just kind of giving you an idea of some of the things that we can do with these. Now this is the one wall that is on campus that is uh, stereo and tracked. So. Now, they've also created these IQ tables. So these are interactive tables that uh, more than one person can actually manipulate the images on the table and share them and uh, expand the images. And they will take collections and digitize artifacts from these different collections in 2D format and then put them on this um, flat 
kind of IQ wall that's touch screen. So, and it's been used in various places across campus. Our um, Lilly Library actually displayed a copy of the original, well, it's not a copy, but the original manuscript of Jack Kerouac's On the Road. So it was purchased by somebody in Indiana and it was restored at Indiana University. So they actually, um, if you know, the On the Road is one large scroll. He taped together all these pieces of paper in one typewriter and uh, kind of typed it on this large scroll, which was shown in the Lilly Library, but then they digitized it and put it on this kind of touch interface. I've used the IQ table also in a art science collaboration that I did with a plant biologist. And what I did was embed imagery into live leaves. And so, the scientist was really keen not only to show the artwork, but to show the scientific process behind how the artwork was made. And so there's a little movie file on the left-hand side. So I do these sketches, and what I'll do is I'll build up the sketches into paintings, and typically I'll take the paintings and put them in virtual reality. Um, but in this case, we actually embedded the image into a live leaf by irradiating the leaf and forcing the chloroplast movement across the leaf. So we built uh, two IQ tables, one with the interface showing how the, the image is manipulated to show up on the leaf, and then the other table actually shows how chloros, chloroplast movement occurs. So the right one is a movie file. And what you can see is chloroplasts will lay flat on the cell when there is low light levels, but when the light becomes very strong, chloroplasts will move to the side of the plant cell in order to protect themselves. And in those areas, the leaf has a uh, lighter hue because there's less chloroplasts. And that actually changes the leaf surface. And so we're trying to show how chloroplast movement occurs in live leaves at all times so that people can understand that plants just aren't objects, but they're living beings that are reacting to the environment at all times. Okay. We also do information visualization at IU on planar displays as well as spherical displays. And um, our software varies from different types of libraries. This is a use case of um, information visualization with the Happy Trust Digital Library Macroscope. And I don't have much time, but we also do 360 capture. And this is, um, they helped a, someone from the School of Nursing work on a project where they immersed uh, senior patients into virtual nature and then did some test studies on that. We also do 3D scanning, photogrammetry. And we've done that with various collections from the IU School of Medicine and from uh, the Lilly Medical Library. Uh, it has other collections so you can see the original object and the 3D result. Also, we've been creating all kinds of advanced media. This is um, a stereo 3D media projection that was a spherical 360 capture that was shown on the IQ wall, but we also have capability to do things with um, other systems in order to develop for VR, video games, and the web, et cetera. And so we found out that we've had a lot of curricular impacts and research impacts with this philosophy of abundance. 
And uh, I think I'm going to stop here because I'm kind of running out of time. So. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> okay.